Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the Innovation Forum, which is the tenth in the series uh, that's being hosted by the Australia's Management Centre and also kindly sponsored by the Sunday Times. And also, I'd uh, just like to take this time to thank uh, Barbara Gallows for providing their latest innovation, which is a al aluminium bodied uh, XJ Jaguar. It's very gorgeous. And um, today's theme is labour market shortage strategies, how to retain, develop and attract innovative people. What I'd like to do uh, just for this moment is just to spend a few minutes just to set the scene and then allow you to enjoy breakfast until 8.15. So for those people who don't know me, my name is Greg Kinnaird and I'm the Managing Director of the Australasia Management Centre. We're a Perth-based uh, international consulting company that focuses on management training and innovation strategies. So to do that, we conduct a series of innovation forums, uh, a series of management programs, uh, with our public program being the management program, and also too we uh, do corporate uh, coaching as well. In regards to the format for this morning, we'll let you enjoy breakfast up until 8.15. The hot meals will be served uh, in just a moment. And then at uh, 8.15, I'll introduce the first speaker, who is Dr Neville Binning from the Department of Planning and Infrastructure. Uh, Neville will talk for 15 minutes, and then from there I'll introduce Maura Watson, who is from HBOS, uh, who's a HR practitioner and uh, manager of leadership development. Uh, Maura will talk for 15 minutes, and then after that I'll then introduce Tony Noonan, who's the group manager for McMahon's, McMahon Holdings Limited. There's a key message out of this morning, and I'll just reinforce this key message between uh, each of the speakers, and that is what we're experiencing today is simply a snapshot to what we could expect in the year 2012. Now, I'll let you draw your own conclusions uh, as you're hearing the speakers, but essentially what we're experiencing with the labour shortage, uh, uh, labour market shortage uh, at the moment, is really a tap on the shoulder of what's going to happen uh, in the next five to 10 years as people exit out of the workplace into retirement. So from my perspective, what I actually see is we're getting a, a dry run at the real game in five years' time. So now is the time to actually learn from this experience uh, and then um, apply that in the next five years. Interestingly, the, the mix of people in this room, just to let you know, we have roughly about uh, 200 people in the room. Um, most people would be from large corporate organisations. So can I just get a show of hands? Could I, um, who works in an organisation greater than 100? Can I just get a show of hands? Yeah, okay, so quite a number of people. Uh, about 80% of the people here are from government, so to me this really indicates that uh, people that are attracted to larger uh, process um, uh, organisations that um, uh, people are looking for job security are really going to be the companies that are going to have the challenge in the next five to ten years because most people who have worked in your companies have primarily or probably uh, worked in your organisation uh, for maybe five, ten or fifteen years and just waiting for retirement in the next five or ten years. Who knows? An interesting focus for us to have for our innovation forum, looking at labour market shortage. So what I'd like to do is just to um, extend the invitation for you to enjoy breakfast. Um, I'll be up on stage again at 8.15. Uh, and until then, bon appetit. <laughs> okay, good morning. I trust that, uh, that you're enjoying breakfast. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker um, and again just to reinforce that the focus of today's breakfast forum is labour market shortage strategies. Our first speaker will focus on uh, innovation and the labour market shortage here within Australia. So Neville will be taking a, uh, a bigger picture of the situation. Uh, Dr Neville Binning is the General Manager of the Licensing Business Unit for the Department of Planning Infrastructure. Uh, he was assigned to the role in, the late, 2000, in late 2004 in the midst of the business unit facing significant challenges, principally concerning the implementation of a major information system. Dr Binning commenced his professional career as a civil engineer with the main roads of WA. After a broad range of engineering roles, he became involved in major organisational change initiatives. Much of this work concerned the development and implementation of strategic asset management as related to the public infrastructure. Uh, Dr Benning will share with you his findings on how innovation, both te technological and non-technological, is critical as a key driver of economic growth. 
uh, sorry, of uh, economic growth uh, with business in Australia. He will also draw the connection between the current labour market shortage and the need for organisations to be innovative by implementing new or significantly improving organisational processes or goods of, or services. So ladies and gentlemen, will we please welcome Dr Neville Binning. Uh, thanks very much, Greg, and um, uh, yes, welcome. Uh, and certainly thank you for the opportunity to uh, present some, some ideas. Uh, the, the title uh, says it all, innovation. Um, I'm talking about innovation in the context of the labour shortage in Australia. Uh, innovation being simply anything that's, uh, uh, that, that's a good idea. Uh, it, it goes far beyond just creating good ideas. Uh, I mean, that's great fun and, and relatively easy to, uh, uh, to, to my mind. Uh, it goes well beyond that. It's actually putting those great ideas into action. Um, but it's very much uh, about people. Innovation is about people. And as the, uh, the picture depicts, as always, uh, I'm committed to a helicopter view. Labour supply. It, it, in fact, is there a shortage? Um, well, I believe so. And by way of uh, an indication, last Friday I was at a meeting. Uh, I was meeting with our colleagues in the, uh, the union movement. A uh, gentleman there, JJ O'Connor, uh, with a long background in uh, uh, the union movement and a former um, commissioner for the Industrial Relations Commission of Australia. Uh, after the meeting, as you do, you talk about uh, th these sorts of issues. And he related uh, uh, a story he, he had recently heard where uh, a truck driver from Perth was uh, uh, contracted to drive up north to take uh, large earth moving uh, equipment up to a, uh, up to a mining site. Uh, on arrival there, uh, people at the, uh, the mining site uh, certainly thanked him for the, uh, the earth moving equipment, uh, desperately needed, uh, and then asked how much he was being paid as the truck driver, offered him twice that uh, to stay and drive the machinery. Um, on the weekend, browsing through the papers, uh, there was an article there, there's a, a website that's recently been created uh, where there's on offer up to $10,000 uh, as a spotter's fee for certain uh, categories of work. So, uh, if uh, to the extent they're, they're good indicators, yes, I think there's very much a, a labour, labour shortage in Australia. Um, the, the shortage relates to skills, yes, very much so. Certainly uh, science and engineering type skills. Um, to address those requires a long-term and strategic view. It also requires a collaborative approach of industry, employees and the government. So I just the, uh, the, the work, workforce is, is shrinking. Uh, if, if you like, uh, there's less people coming into the workforce uh, from the uh, from the local scene, uh, as compared to um, uh, those uh, that are leaving. More are leaving than are than are coming in. Now, skills and, and size issues can be addressed to some extent by immigration, but but my sense is this: that um, uh, to move people around, other than uh, immediate sort of hot spots and uh, a bit of a, a temporary make do. Uh, it's really just a replication of that truck driver uh, type approach. You really don't solve the problem. You simply solve, uh, solve one instance of it and move the problem elsewhere. Uh, I've got the, uh, the title there, Women. Uh, women in the workforce, uh, yes, there's a shortage of women, but it's predominantly at the higher levels. A recent Financial Review magazine article uh, talked in terms of you know, the wasted talent. Uh, the, the women in the workforce that are not, uh, for whatever reason, being enabled to find their way to the, uh, the higher levels of management and leadership. But it's primarily configuration um, that, that I wanted to talk about. It's the composition of the workforce. Uh, it's about uh, how the different generations, uh, the mix of them is changing. Uh, there's the baby boomers, those 42 to uh, 60 years of age, uh, the X generation, 27 to 41. I mean, this is the age as at uh, the end of last uh, last calendar year. Uh, y generation, those that are 12 and uh, through to 26. But it's not just that um, we have these different generations and it's an age thing. Uh, they are fundamentally different. And, and I know that's a sort of a, a generalised statement, but uh, there's enough around in the literature um, uh, to uh, strongly suggest that that is the case. Um, by and large, each of the generations has... Um, uh, has been nurtured in, in a different way, exposed to uh, varying degrees to the technology and so on that uh, uh, now characterises our, uh, our modern life. 
And if I can just, uh, as an aside, uh, make reference to this presentation. Um, I was the only bamer, baby boomer involved in putting this together. Uh, there was Carolyn Edwards, Chris Innes, Sarah Jones and Cromwell Ellie uh, were also involved. So all the generations were involved in the presentation. And uh, to, that, to that extent, it represents, I think, far more than this baby boomer's uh, uh, perhaps limited view of, uh, of the world. Uh, pictures. I always like to try and get uh, a picture that crystallises uh, what we're on about. So if you bear with me, I'll quickly walk, uh, walk us through this one. The, um, the, the baseline there represents uh, people not unlike myself and uh, I guess many of you out there. Uh, yeah, we're, we're creeping up to that time when, uh, uh, if it suits us, we could, uh, could retire. Uh, there's a dotted line there that suggests that some of us, uh, myself included, don't uh, see the prospect of just walk, walking out and playing bowls or, or golf or, heaven forbid, fishing uh, as the way to go, that we may be tempted to, uh, uh, to package the career uh, maybe move it around amongst different organisations and whatever, in other words, we'll still be uh, a, a part of the workforce. And to some extent that softens the blow uh, or the impact of um, there being more of us than Generation X and Y uh, people. So the, the green line that uh, plots up there shows that there's already a good presence in the workforce of uh, X generation folk. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, I imagine many of you are uh, out there. But uh, yeah, less of you and more given to, to, to being mobile. And then there's the Y generation, and they, uh, they are really mobile if we accept what we read in the literature and certainly consistent with my experience with uh, working uh, with some of them. So what we've got in effect is uh, an increasingly mobile workforce, and just re reiterating Greg's point, that uh, uh, what we see now is really just a, a, a good insight to, to what's further down the track. Uh, it will require a fairly fundamental shift, I think, in our thinking as to how we uh, attract and retain people in the workforce. But I think the notion of retaining, uh, we need to put a, uh, a different spin on that. Um, in essence, we don't own people. Uh, we need to accept that people are increasingly looking for mobile careers. I strongly encourage people to plot up um, this sort of diagram and relate it to your HR stats to get a good insight into your own organisation. For instance, in uh, the licensing business unit, uh, with help from, uh, from Sarah Jones, we, we looked at the figures and we find that, um, uh, in essence, there are, uh, out of a workforce of 600 plus, there are 41, I think, uh, baby boomers upon, who, upon whom we are most dependent. And all of them can walk out, walk out the door today uh, in terms of retirement. They're, they're of that age. How do I know that there's 41? You look at the leave liability and overtime. Um, uh, stats. Uh, we are working them really hard uh, of sheer necessity. Fingers crossed they don't decide all to walk out en masse and that we can start bringing through those younger generations. So given it's a virtual workforce, uh, people don't stay forever. I've mentioned uh, we, we don't own them. Um, so the issue becomes very much about how do you attract and retain people so that you ensure you've got this critical mass, you don't fall below critical mass. Um, and if you like, there's a, there's a very simple equation. I think it's the, the value of the contribution people make whilst they're in the workplace minus the cost of attracting and uh, inducting and, and training. So contribution minus cost equals profit. So long as it's a positive number, you're in front. Uh, I think there's a, a mindset shift required that uh, uh, you don't have to attract and retain forever um, people. Um, if you like, get used to uh, people coming and going. And I think that in itself, to the extent an organisation can enable that to occur, uh, becomes a part of the attraction uh, mix. Uh, a workplace where uh, you can come, contribute, uh, go off and do other things, possibly come back, that type of uh, arrangement. Next dot point there, uh, flexibility. Um, that there's a real push on. People want uh, more flexibility. It's, uh, life's pretty complicated. Uh, family and work balance is an issue. In fact, uh, the weekend just gone, there was an article in one of the papers again, uh, where there's talk of legislating uh, that the workplace must provide for flexibility so that people can uh, adequately maintain uh, uh, um, families and so on. Uh, there's also investing in people. Uh, I've taken uh, from Lorraine McPherson and others from HR just a sampling of some of the programs that we have on offer there. But it's largely innovation uh, that I wanted to quickly talk about, as Greg is already prompting. Uh, innovation, 
if you take a whole of business view, and uh, certainly for the licensing business unit, there's uh, lots going on. Uh, still a long way to go, I hasten to add. Information technology, uh, we have a major piece of work, an IT platform for e-government. Uh, yes, you don't hear much about it these days because it's uh, very much stable and strengthened and uh, uh, being managed as a whole of government, uh, as I say, IT platform. Strategic partners, Alan Gregory, uh, uh, amongst us today, he and his people um, better integrating our business with some of our key uh, uh, suppliers and partners. Policy, Trevor Morn again uh, with us, he and his people looking at some policy research, our contribution to safe drivers uh, in, in safe vehicles. The safe drivers, the uh, people in remote communities, the elderly and certainly the young, there's some exciting stuff. Uh, happening there, and commercial opportunities. Uh, gee, we deal with a lot of data, and I think it's worth a lot of money, but uh, uh, we, we need to, uh, to to progress that. And service delivery, we'll watch this space. Uh, we're currently talking with uh, our staff and uh, unions in terms of how we can do better there. Right, this is the main thrust in the minute or so that remains. Um, at the individual level, uh, it gets down to, you know, what's in it for me? Well, people actually get a buzz, certainly my experience and the experience of people I, uh, uh, I mix with, they get a buzz out of being involved and contributing. They like to make a difference. But the real, uh, uh, the, the real uh, spin, if you like, is that to the extent people do get involved, do make a difference, uh, their contribution or achievement attaches to their reputation. Uh, they become more valuable in themselves that uh, certainly promotes their career prospects, either within the particular organisation or this notion of a very mobile career. They, uh, by virtue of being involved, contribute through innovation and so on, um, uh, definitely, uh, definitely get uh, something out of it that's quite tangible. How do you bring that about in the workplace? Uh, I've tried to crystallise it as the three E's. Uh, expect, well, how do you expect innovation? Uh, you put together plans, a consultative uh, type approach to that, but make the plans more outcome oriented, not prescriptive, so it gives a broad sense of direction and uh, uh, in terms of what's required. Uh, enable, you support people with the right sort of skills and you provide access to ec experts. In the case of the licensing business unit, uh, we have recently uh, put in place a business improvement team. It's led by someone who's got a black belt or Six Sigma uh, qualification. Right, that of itself is not going to turn the whole business around, but gee, it's a very powerful uh, uh, symbolic thing that um, it really indicates a commitment by, uh, by leadership to, to, to innovation. And that group is now starting to move around and helping people at the local level to, uh, to be more innovative. Uh, the last E, empower. Uh, this is a tricky one. Um, I mean, this is very, very much a behavioural issue. It does beg the, the question, or at least in my mind, well, who needs to be empowered? I don't think it's the Y generation. They are the most empowered group of people I've ever come across. <laughs> they are so uh, self-reliant and self-actualised, all those sorts of uh, characteristics. Uh, the empowerment, I think, is essentially the supervisors and middle management level from the baby boomers. They need to be empowered to work closely uh, with X and particularly the Y generation. Uh, how do we bring that about? Well, the sort of programs that uh, uh, Lorraine McPherson and others in, in our HR area are running um, uh, is starting to, uh, to, to push that, in, in my view. Uh, it's about getting, uh, as I say, those uh, uh, baby boomers more comfortable far less threatened by working with these people. And we've had some real wins there, I think. As an example, uh, we have Greg Forbes uh, has been working increasingly with Y generation people, and uh, gee, uh, that, that whole area is, is leaping ahead. And um, not surprisingly, uh, one of the Y generation people, a young lady, Amira Dedic, one of uh, the people off the graduate program, uh, made a major contribution. She has since moved on. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if she comes back to us in due course. She'll come back with even more skills and she'll certainly come back at a higher level. So, um, watch this space. But, yeah, it, uh, uh, it, it's been a real, uh, real eye-opener for me. Right, conclusion, does it work? Uh, for the licensing business unit, uh, too early to tell. Um, however, uh, People such as Jim Collins, the author of Good to Great, and Ricardo Semler, author of Maverick, they say that it will. And just excuse me for a tick. 
that's the book by uh, uh, Ricardo Semler, uh, The Maverick. Um, so, so why is that so significant? I think the fact that um, uh, that book was a, a gift to me uh, by someone from the Y generation, uh, my son, and I'm really hard pressed to get it off him and he is always willing to talk about it. So uh, that in itself uh, gives me a lot of faith that it will work. Thank you. It's interesting that um, the issue that we're seeing uh, isn't only uh, an Australian problem or a Western Australian problem, but I'm also seeing it when I go to different countries. Um, we're also seeing that there's a labour market shortage and a lot of transition happening. So, for example, people in South Africa are coming to Australia. Uh, why? Because they're mainly looking for safety and security. Uh, people in Singapore are heading off to greater land China. Why? Because of status and career opportunity. Uh, when I've gone, uh, if I look at uh, West Australia, a lot of uh, graduates, particularly accounting graduates or university uh, graduates in different technical fields, are heading off to the UK to chase the euro dollar, which is, I think, roughly about two and a half to three times the Aussie dollar at the moment. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, I just came back from uh, Mauritius on assignment, and it's interesting that they had the same issue with labour shortage. What they're finding is a lot of Mauritians are heading off to French-speaking countries such as Canada. So what we're experiencing here in Western Australia is not just a local issue, but it's a global issue as well. Now, what I'd like to do is just to link um, the different speakers by way of this uh, key message. At the, uh, and this is the audience participation part of it. At the end of your table, you'll notice um, that there'll be a sheet of paper where there's a series of numbers. Can I just ask each person to take a sheet? And also, there should be a pen for each person at the end. This is a very quick activity. And what we'll do is we'll um, go through a series of activities, but I won't tell the answer. Uh, the only person who will know the answer is yourself, and this will be right at the end. <clears throat> so here's the situation. The situation is this, is you have a...